Hello and welcome back to PaleoCast. My name is Dave Marshall and in this episode I took the opportunity to interview Dr. Tom Fletcher of the University of Leicester all about his work looking into the hydrodynamics of fossil fishes. Tom had been down in Bristol for an extended weekend where we spent a lot of time designing the Virtual Natural History Museum and we're also in the field digging up real fossils for an exhibition at a real museum. So keep your ears open for more information on both of these stories soon. There seems to be loads going on in the Paleocast world at the moment, from invitations to record conferences to new equipment that we're looking to obtain, and so there'll be absolutely no shortage of news from us over the next few months. As I mentioned in last week's intro, we're still looking for partners for our art competition, and we'll also be releasing news of this year's podcast awards very soon. Additionally, we'd like to remind you that our blogging platform is available for use, so please email in if you've got a story to tell. As always, pictures to accompany this interview are available on our website, and please help share the episode on social media. Thanks to all those who have rated us on iTunes, and soon you'll be able to get the show via Google Play on your Android device. Anyway, we had a load of fun recording this interview, so I hope you all enjoy listening to it too. Tom's a really great speaker, and the hydrodynamics of fish scales is way more complex than I ever would have thought. Hi Tom, thank you very much for joining us. Hi, thanks. I think we should start off by explaining that you're here in my bedroom, the uh, PaleoCast Studios. Absolutely. Uh, why, why, are you, why are you here? <laughs> uh, I'm here to help you out with the Virtual Natural History Museum, which uh, hopefully will be going live later this year. Uh, very exciting stuff, so making the maps for those, uh, trying to design them to be as interesting as possible, but also so that people can actually walk around in them. You've literally been drawing the museum. I have literally been drawing the museum, yeah. Okay, and uh, and have you got a good feel? You got a good vibe about the project? Absolutely, yeah. It's uh, it's exciting working with the animator, especially and yourself, just getting the details down. It's uh, it's much more effort than I thought to make video games, but it's exciting and it's uh, a lot more creative than the stuff I usually do. So it's great stuff. Right. Uh, so since you were here, I mean, I might as well interview you anyway. So let's start off by getting an understanding of who you are and what you research. Okay. Um, well, yeah, um, I am a paleontologist, a vertebrate paleontologist. And uh, over the last six, seven years, I've been specialising in biomechanics, um, something that drags all of the taxa together. They're all governed by universal physical laws. And, and I like that. So from a very early age, I've been interested in nature. I um, wanted to be a vet at some point, but soon realised I like long dead things much better. <laughs> They're far more interesting. And uh, of course, 99% of all life on earth is dead now. So why not study it? Uh, and that's that's me. Now I'm at the University of Leicester uh, as, a, as a teacher, uh, lecturing in vertebrate paleontology. Before that, at the University of Leeds, which we'll talk a bit about today, I expect. And then before that, at, uh, right here, actually, right in Bristol, the University of Bristol, studying a very good, high quality master's in <laughs> paleontology and evolution. Yeah, I, I wish they would pay us for every time <laughs> we mention it, but... You're not getting paid? No, <laughs> I wish. Yeah, maybe not put that bit in. <laughs> you ruined that take now, man. Yeah. So you're looking at biomechanics, but any group in particular or just everything and anything... Um, so uh, while I was at Bristol, I, I started studying ungulate jaws, the mammal jaws, um, using a technique called finite element analysis, which uh, some of you listeners might be familiar with. Um, I was unemployed for a year and then a project came up on fishes. And I normally wouldn't have been interested in fishes, but uh, I took it on and uh, I've not looked back since. Fishes are incredibly cool creatures. Um, and the hydrodynamics is a fascinating part of it, which despite the fact it's so important and it's such a fundamental part, a governing force of what shapes a fish, um, not much uh, has been done on it. It's not as much as uh, I would expect or hope. So that's that's me filling that niche. So in your introduction, you said that the laws of biomechanics are still as applicable today as they were in the past. So if we're looking at things in a um, an aquatic environment, 
the laws of hydrodynamics would still be the same. And so what else can you learn? I mean, we must know about the hydrodynamics of animals alive today, then surely we can just apply that to the past. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, physical laws govern everything. And for hundreds of millions of years, that hasn't changed. There's only so much that an animal can do uh, in an environment, uh, whether it's moving or, or feeding or anything else that relates to the mechanical interaction with its environment. So by studying modern animals, Animals, that's that's fantastic analog for what was going on hundreds of millions of years ago and you can say with fair certainty that things are doing the same thing because the physical laws haven't changed what sorts of challenges do aquatic animals actually face when they move through water animals living in water face a much denser fluid it is uh, thicker than air it's much more viscous and it takes a lot more effort to move it out the way while you're moving through it um, so people uh, studying hydrodynamics will talk a lot about drag and drag is anything that impedes velocity that slows things down and the uh, speed and the efficiency of movement through the water is very much governed by the forces acting against it so a lot of animals that live in the water will have uh, basic streamlining. If you've ever took your hand and moved it through the water via swimming, you'll know that if you have your hand parallel to the water, it's a lot of force against it. But if you pretend that your hand's a knife, it will slide right through. That's basic streamlining. All fish and animals in the water would do well just to be pencil shaped uh, to move through the water with ultimate efficiency. But of course, you have to have inside bits, the, the stomach and the skeleton, things like this. So there's a trade off between being streamlined and having a shape that means you can do what you need to do to be an animal. So if we just think about fish, fish are fish shaped. Is that just simply because that's the most hydrodynamic shape they can be? Absolutely. Um, a fish needs to be streamlined and reduce drag as much as possible with its shape, but it also needs to have innards. It needs to have the inside bits of a fish. So there is a trade-off between uh, being a complete torpedo shape and also doing what it needs to do, depending on its behaviour, its ecology and its feeding as well. So, for example, fishes that live on the bottom of the sea will often be flat and pancake shaped. They're not swimming very much. Um, they want to reduce their drag as much as possible. So by hugging the bottom of the ocean floor, being nice and flat, they're doing, they're doing their thing uh, in terms of drag reduction, but in a different way. They don't have the same physical demands on them as, say, a tuna or something that's swimming very uh, quickly through the water. So pelagic fish, those that are living in the water column, they tend to be more torpedo shaped than those on the bottom of the sea. But within those fish that swim in the water column, you have lots of different shapes and sizes depending on their behaviour and ecology. So for example, uh, fish that are swimming constantly at uh, fast cruise speeds, they'll look like tuna. And lots and lots of fish that are not related to tuna will still have that same shape if they're doing the same job. Um, butterfly fish as well, these um, large plate-like fish, they're designed to move quickly. They have a short turning circle because they're not swimming constantly in one direction. They're manoeuvring a lot and that shape facilitates that kind of um, behaviour. The best example, I think, really, is the dart-shaped fishes. So some of them have uh, lots and lots of fins right at the back, and they're, they're dart-shaped. So things like pikes and baloney, they're all very narrow and pointy. And those fish are darting. They're darting quickly. They're not maintaining speeds um, uh, every day, um, all the time. They just need really sharp, short uh, bursts of speed to catch prey and they all have fins right at the back. So if we find a fish in the fossil record that has the same kind of fin arrangement and body shape, we can say with fair certainty that they're doing the same because that is the optimum shape for that behaviour. So shape plays a really important part in how animals live in an aquatic environment, but how else can they optimise themselves for life in water? So there are lots of things, some things we can see in the fossil record and some things we can't. Um, for example, behaviour we can't observe directly, um, but we know from modern animals that there's a whole host of different things they can do to reduce drag just by uh, changing the way they act. So for example, breaching. Um, porpoises will leap from the water to move through air rather than the water below. Flying fish will leave the water completely. Even some rays will jump out of the water, to, not only to escape predators, but also to increase the efficiency of their their movement. As well, um, we'll, we'll never really know if certain species school. Um, not quite the same as shoaling, but fishes moving together in one direction can reduce the, the drag that they, uh, they experience. 
But if I just jump in before you, don't we have fossilised flying fish? We do, absolutely. And their wings, if you want to call them, the, uh, those are uh, intact and exquisitely preserved. I think it's the Lebanese specimens especially mm. that have these. Um, so yes, this is another example where the, the shape is a real giveaway uh, about how these animals are, are living. But I'm glad you brought it back to fish because fish have a fair few tricks up their sleeve. Um, gill ventilation is, is one of them. Fish will actively push fluid back through their gills uh, and they can reduce the drag that way, uh, providing thrust almost. Um, there's air in feathers. Underneath the feathers of penguins as they dive into the water, they will uh, reduce the viscous properties of the, of the water around them by having a, a cloak of bubbles. Mucus. Mucus is incredibly good at reducing drag by up to 60% in some fishes. These are all things that we can't see uh, directly in the fossil record, but we have evidence for it in the modern day. But in the fossil records, um, we do see evidence of uh, drag reduction in the soft tissue. So for example, uh, collagen is a very stringy but strong um, tissue. And what we can do uh, is observe collagen tissue uh, in certain orientations in the fossil record like we have today. Um, so animals that live on land, their collagen fibres and their skin tends to be very messily orientated. Uh, whereas animals that are in the ocean, they tend to have a, a mesh like chicken wire, uh, which spirals about the axis of the body. The reason for this is that it allows the body to recoil back into its original shape, um, like a, an elastic band wound around an animal. So by doing that, if a shark moves its tail to the right, it springs back to the left with relatively effort, a little effort. Um, and it also keeps the skin really nice and tight and smooth. Um, so they can reduce drag that way just by reducing the folds in the skin. Um, and we find uh, this kind of collagen in uh, exquisitely preserved ichthyosaurs um, and, and in fishes as well. Um, the other thing that we don't find necessarily in the fossil record, but we've got good evidence for is uh, a compliant surface. So uh, just having a springy, bouncy surface to the skin can reduce uh, drag in experimental conditions by about 6%. And by having a slightly spongy tissue, um, those those vortexes, those messy flows of fluid can be uh, evened out across the surface of the body. So, and lastly, the, just going back to the shape of an animal, some of the fossil fish that we find um, actually have a form of vortex control. They have um, a shape uh, on the body which uh, not only is streamlined, but can also manipulate the vortices that form across the body, um, almost like a... Um, uh, a delta wing, um, I think that's how it was described in the literature, we have this fish called Erivaspis, um, which is producing vortices, these swirling spirals of, of fluid, these funnels of fluid, um, which can not only self-correct the body, this fish doesn't really have fins uh, to speak of, um, but it can also produce thrust. It drags water from the front through this funnel of spiralling fluid and out the back, providing additional thrust as well. So there's a whole host of uh, strategies animals can use, um, not only to, to speed themselves up, by, uh, but also improve their manoeuvrability by, by um, manipulating the flow moving over them. So if we take a moment to examine your work in particular, you've been looking at Paleozoic fishes and the scales that they have. Can you start off by telling us what a fish scale actually is? Um, a scale is a hard tissue um, that fishes uh, and other animals have uh, as a protective layer. Um, it seems that most scales are uh, there to protect the animal to produce a hard outer layer, which is also uh, movable as well. So um, lots of armour in uh, in history looks like fish scales. They can overlap little discrete units of tile-like um uh, pieces. Um, so the animal or the human wearing the armour can move around as much as possible while uh, maintaining an armoured surface. Um, but what I'm interested in is the hydrodynamics of the scales. And very often the scales are covered in soft tissue, uh, gunky stuff that we can't really see uh, in the fossil record very often. Um, so I'm principally interested in those scales that are exposed directly to the immediate environment. Um, shark scales are very much like human teeth. They, they erupt from the soft tissue and that hard tissue, which is also preserved in the fossil record, is in direct contact with the water around it. And because of that, we can model and look at the way that fluid interacts 
uh, with those particular scales. So things like the uh, thelodont fish, these jawless fish from the Paleozoic, uh, and also the uh, acanthodians, not really a proper group, but the spiny sharks uh, have these kinds of scales. Is that why a shark is rough, if you run your finger across its surface. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so they're all directed uh, downstream and they overlap just like uh, roof tiles. And if you're stroking it the right way, they're all nice and flat. Um, whereas if you're stroking it the wrong way, I don't think you'd want to do that to an angry shark, um, then it's going to feel very rough. And actually, they used to use uh, shark skin as sandpaper. Um, and uh, I hear also that they used to use it for the handles of swords. Um, because it was so rough, um, it could be coated in blood and still have a grip on it. So uh, it certainly has applications. And so simply put, the water would go the the right way across the surface and it'd be extra slippy that way. Is that all there is to it? Yeah, that's part of it. A lot of people have studied shark scales for many, many years. Uh, they've really been a source of fascination for physicists and biomechanists like myself they turning the wrong way, the fluid moving the wrong way is a really, really bad thing to happen across the surface of a of a shark. Um, on a, on a wing for, of a plane, for example, um, when fluid starts to reverse and starts to swirl, you call that wing stall. Uh, that's a bad thing, and it's really bad for fish as well because if you've got swirling, if you've got reversing flow, then that really increases the drag. That re increases the amount of effort you need to move through water. So sharks are really trying to reduce the wake, the reversing fluid across the body as much as possible. And by having all of these scales all facing one direction in the stream direction, they can do that. And some sharks, even the uh, the mako sharks and the great whites and things, they can uh, bristle their scales upwards if the flow does start to reverse. And uh, much like uh, the little things you can see on plane wings where if the fluid is starting to rotate, if the air is starting to rotate, they just flap up. Um, it's completely passive. They have no control over it. But over every square centimetre of a shark, as the water's moving over the surface, you have little minute movements of these scales that are baffling the flow and stopping reversal. The surface of these scales aren't smooth either. They have uh, peaks and troughs, these grooves that run the length of the scale, and these are reducing drag as well. Um, they can reduce drag by up to 10%, in fact, um, partially by altering the way that the fluid moves over their surface, but also by holding the water, uh, the vast majority of the water's movement above the surface. It can reduce the interaction, uh, the surface area of, uh, of shark that's actually interacting with the moving fluid. So on a microscopic scale, these things are, are altering the flow. So just to pull you up on that, it kind of creates its own little cushion of static water, is it? In effect, yeah. Um, the water that's in direct contact with the shark is moving very, very slowly. The best uh, analogy for this is if you have a pack of cards and each one of those layers of a card is a layer of water molecules. If I throw those cards across a table, the card that's in contact with the table will slow down really quickly. The card above that will move slightly further and slightly faster, and so on and so on, until the card right at the top is moving at about the same speed as you threw them in the first place. And we have this kind of um, boundary layer, this kind of profile of velocity um, building up from the surface of the animal uh, across the whole animal. And what the riblets are doing is they're reducing the friction right at the bottom there. They're reducing uh, the amount of um, detraction from the velocity of a fluid moving over its surface. So having a bumpy table would reduce the amount of table in contact with that first card? In a basic sense, yes, but the riblets really have to be nice and linear. Uh, they have to be in line with the flow. Um, if they're not parallel to the flow, then they can do the opposite. They can create roughness and uh, not control the fluid quite as, uh, as well. It's very complex uh, interaction. In some cases, an animal might want to create a bit of chaos. Uh, in some instances across the body, they might want to, to reduce that, that chaos, that turbulence. And in sharks, it seems that there's a bit of both going on. On the heads, you have uh, scales which are nice and smooth and they don't have these riblets on them, whereas on the body, they do. Um, so just like a golf ball, at the heads, they want to create a little bit of craziness. They want to create a bit of um, turbulence in the in the uh, the fluid moving over the surface, and then later down on the body, um, they want to control it. 
Um, golf balls used to be, this is a bit of a tangent, but golf balls used to be completely smooth until people started to realize that they were moving further and faster if they were um, they were battered. So people started to, to hammer the balls, the wooden balls that they used to play with uh, to make them go faster. And it's only very recently or comparatively recently that we've realized quite how this is working. It's by cr- creating turbulence, creating craziness, that some of the momentum, some of the force that is directing the fluid to go forwards is also directed back towards the surface and the fluid hugs the surface for a bit longer and decreases the wake, the amount of swirling, really big scale craziness that can uh, really increase drag later down the body. So as any paleontologist will tell you, the fossil record is incredibly biased towards the preservation of hard parts opposed to soft parts. So if we take a shark, for example, which has got the hard scales on its outside and the relatively soft inside, its cartilaginous skeleton, if the scales are preserved, uh, but the rest isn't, they would most likely become disarticulated, they'd all separate out. And so if we found an individual scale, how would we know which kind of shark this came from? Especially considering the fact that you've just mentioned that the scales vary from the front to the back of even an individual animal. Absolutely. It's um, it's very, very difficult to tell if it's from the same animal, the same species. Um, lots of times in the descriptions of these scales, um, they're either isolated completely um, or they're, they're scale sets where they're found in the same rock, but nobody's really sure if they're from the same animal. Um, but it does get worse. It gets a lot worse, unfortunately. Not only do you get different scale types on different parts of the body, um, my work seems to show that you have different scales depending on the age of the animal uh, and also even maybe even the gender as well. Um, so there is a lot of variability there. Um, and really, I think the fossil record maybe uh, overrepresents the number of species that, uh, that are preserved, but uh, certainly a lot more work needs to be done in that field. So people would describe a new species based off of a single scale? Sometimes, yes. And those descriptions uh, are are very useful. Um, But in context of the hydrodynamics, the part of the body that the scale's from, um, there there is data missing there, of course. Very, very rarely do you find an articulated, a fully formed and intact um, acanthodian or thelodont. Very, very rarely do you find uh, intact sharks. Um, So it's it's a real problem um, for people like me who need that information about where the scales are and uh, whether they're from the same animal or not. I find it really interesting as well that there's difference between age or the ontogeny of the animal, uh, the individual, and then also the sexes. If uh, the scales and its hydrodynamics reflect a lifestyle, uh, do we see any differences in the ecology of different ages and different sexes sharks? That's that's presumably the case. Um, the in poor beagle sharks, we have um, scales that have riblets on them throughout life, but those riblets change angle um, throughout their life. So the bigger the animal gets, uh, the different the difference the angles are. Um, and honestly, we don't know why this is yet. Uh, it, need, it needs work, but there's obviously a signal there um, that can be explained somehow with a function. Um, and it's uh, up to us to do the fundamental uh, fluids research to figure out why that's happening. Um, in some cases, you have differences between the sexes because uh, of mating. So in cat sharks, for example, the, the female uh, has different shaped scales around the gills, uh, which is where the male will will bite quite ferociously during mating. So there are some modern examples where we can really pin it down. But in the fossil record, obviously, it's a lot more challenging. Just thinking off the top of my head here, could it just simply be size? Uh, as you grow, you get bigger, and then there might also be a size difference between males and females. Certainly, yeah. So great white sharks, for example, the females tend to be bigger than the males. Um, and the way that fluid acts around the body will change as the animal's uh, shape and size changes too. So yes, that could be the case. So realistically, what can the shark-like scales of fossilised fishes tell us about their hydrodynamics? Well, for one, uh, these scales are exposed to the fluid environment. Uh, When the animal was alive, the hard tissue was interacting with the fluid. So 
there are certain features of the scales that we can use uh, using modern analogues of sharks to infer what was going on on a microscopic scale. So inferring and interpreting uh, behavior and ecology is a step up and beyond for now. Returning to the riblets, uh, we mentioned briefly before these peaks and troughs that we see on the surface of the scales. The spacing of those riblets is really important. At higher speeds, they are more efficient at um, reducing drag if they're closer together. Whereas if they're further apart, then they're more efficient at reducing drag at slower speeds. And we see in slow moving sharks that the riblets are further apart. And in faster moving sharks, things like the mako and the great white, they're closer together. And in fossil fishes, uh, thelodonts especially, we see those riblets are quite close together. It doesn't matter how big or how small the fish is, the fluid moving over that surface is at peak efficiency at higher speeds. It's worth noting that things like great whites, they do generally move at fairly slow speeds during most of their, their time. Uh, a metre per second for, for a big animal is, is fairly fairly lumbering. Um, so we're not talking about little tiny paleozoic fishes that can swim as fast as a, a breaching great white attacking a seal or anything like that. We're just um, saying that the thelodonts, these paleozoic fishes, were reducing drag in what we consider to be a quite a technologically innovative way uh, as long as go perhaps as a 460 million years ago. Some of the first scales we see in the fossil record have these riblets, have these peaks and troughs across the scale surface in, in nice parallel lines. We also see the same pattern across the body of different scale types in the rare instances where these Paleozoic fishes are preserved intact. Um, so we find some Acanthodians and Thelodonts uh, that are, are perfectly preserved. There's lots of Scottish specimens, for example, which are nicely preserved. And the scales on the head, just like in modern sharks, are, are fairly rounded. They're smooth often. Uh, they don't overlap. And on the body, the main portion of the body, the flank, um, they are um, ornamented. They have these uh, drag reducing features on the scales. Um, they're all overlapping often. So we see the same kind of distribution as well. And there must be hydrodynamic reasons for this. So throughout this interview, we've been looking at the present, looking at the physics, and then applying that to fossil animals to understand more about them. But conversely, can we look at the shape and the morphology of scales in the past and use those to un better understand physics in the present day. Yeah, certainly. I think the fact that these drag reducing mechanisms are present um, 460 million years onwards, and we see the same patterns of scale, the same distributions, the same methods of reducing drag for so long in uh, relatively unrelated groups of animals shows that there is an underlying physical process there that we still don't really understand. Uh, I think getting a grasp of that is going to be really interesting uh, and uh, a, a real source of... Uh, a focus for research in the future. So from a paleontological perspective, what's the future of hydrodynamical research? So first and foremost, uh, just the taxa, the scope of taxa that we study. Um, we've talked a lot about sharks today uh, because of me. Thank you very much. That's my specialism. Uh, but there are plenty more fish in the sea. <laughs> Uh, the sailfish, for example. Um, the sailfish is the uh, fastest fish in the sea today. Uh, depending on what fishermen you believe, and they are prone to exaggeration, they could be up to uh, 40, 50, 60 kilometres an hour. They are certainly the fastest fish in the sea. But because we don't have uh, much fossil evidence of the, the skin tissues or the mucus of these things, uh, it's a bit trickier to study those kind of animals. Um, as well, paleontology is um, very used to borrowing engineering techniques and uh, some of the equipment that engineers use uh, to solve problems for, for bridges and for structures that they're making, uh, we can apply that same technology and those, those methods to the fossil record and problems they're in. Uh, for example, finite element analysis is used to study the uh, mechanical properties of solid objects, but we can also use computational fluid dynamics to model the way that water or air moves over or around or in between biological structures. Um, and I think that's going to be uh, happening a lot more in uh, the next few years. Um, up in Leeds, when we were studying the scales, we were able to print uh, scales in very high resolution, 3D printing in nine micrometer 
uh, layers, really, really high resolution, putting them in a flume tank uh, and then using a laser to measure the skin friction, um, the velocity of the fluid moving over its surface in really, really high resolution. You can use laser lights to create uh, image fields and track individual particles. And with the computers available, it makes that kind of job uh, much more accessible for all kinds of scientists working in different fields. And increasing uh, computer power opens up all sorts of possibilities as well. Um, there are people uh, studying plesiosaurs at the moment that can model um, the, the movement of the fins, uh, the, the flappy paddle-like fins, um, optimising the way that they move to uh, decrease drag as much as possible and increase thrust. Um, the computer is essentially learning how to swim from scratch. Um, there are people who've done this with dinosaur walking as well. And I can see more and more of that happening over, over years to come. Uh, it's a really exciting time because of the sheer power of computing ability that we have at our disposal. So it sounds like there's a potential wealth of inspiration for modern technology from the fossil record and lots more exciting research to come. So I guess there's only one thing left to do and that's to say so long and thanks for all the fish. <laughs> thanks, Dave. <laughs> Paleocast was brought to you by Dave Marshall, with Joe Keating, Laura Sol, Liz Martin Silverstone, and Caitlin Colary. It was made possible by funding from the Paleontological Society and the Paleontological Association, but the show now relies on contributions from you, the listeners. If you've liked this episode, please consider donating, and thanks to everyone that's helped out so far. We'd also like to thank the Ocean Collective for use of their music. Please visit paleocast.com for the supplementary material to this episode and for our archive of past programmes. Subscribe to our Twitter feed at Paleocast and like us at facebook.com forward slash Paleocast to get all the latest news. And so if we find an individual scale, how do we know which species... species? And so if we find an individual scale, how would we know which species... Which... And so if we find an individual scale, how would we know which species that... <laughs> Say it three times. Species. No. And so if we find an individual scale, how would we know which genus? <laughs> <laughs>